Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Munson with Forge, and I am here today to uh, get us started on the medical and forensic considerations in caring for transgender sexual assault survivors. I'm really thrilled that uh, we have two guest speakers today, Kim Day from International Association of Forensic Nurses and Eric Stiles from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Um, as always, we have a, a very full 90 minutes full of lots of interesting information, and we're really excited to, to get going today. I wanted to briefly um, mention and acknowledge that we're definitely not going to be covering Trans 101 issues, and we have uh, many pre-recorded Trans 101 webinars on our website. So I encourage you, if you need or would like some of those core concept reviews, to check out our website and, and review those, those webinars on, on Trans 101 issues. So today we'll really be focused on uh, forensic exams and a little bit more of a 201 discussion. So many of you that have been on our webinars before or seen a, one of our workshops and at conferences have seen this slide and this image. And I just want to remind everybody that um, it's really important that we take care of ourselves. And so if the content or discussion is painful or difficult, that I encourage you to step away or do whatever you need to do. Um, we will be recording this. We are recording it. So you can come back and listen to it um, at a later time if that's uh, better for you to do so. Um, a question that we get frequently is around if we're sending out PowerPoint uh, slides afterwards. We will be sending those out tomorrow, and we'll be sending it out with a link to the archived recording so that you can share the, the link or rewatch or do whatever you'd like with that archived, archived recording. We'll have a couple of moments of interaction today, and let me just show you a screen that will um, help you do that. Um, so if you would like to ask questions today or um, in any way interact with us, uh, Larry Cook Daniels, Forge's other staff person, is going to be the predominant person that is addressing questions and monitoring things. So please use that question box for those um, questions that you have. We are grateful that this webinar and all of them in our series are supported by the Office on Violence Against Women, and we're really, um, really pleased that they, they value this, this content and, and we can provide it to you for free. So let me tell you a little bit about who's who. Um, as I mentioned, we have two really great presenters today. Um, the first one is going to be Kim Day with um, IAFN, and uh, she's going to start us off with some really great content. Um, Eric Stiles is going to come in uh, later in our, our conversation today, and he is uh, from the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Um, I, I again, am, am Michael Munson with, uh, with Forge, and the other person that you won't hear very much of today is Larry Cook Daniels, also with Forge. So again, she'll be handling most of the, the behind the scenes questions, and you'll hear more from her at the end of our, our time today. So let me review our agenda really briefly. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just reviewing some trans basics and making sure that we're all on the same page around what population we're talking about. Um, I will have just a couple of slides on sexual violence data related to trans folks. And then we'll turn things over to Kim, who will talk about the national protocol and some trans-specific um, implications with working uh, with trans survivors and forensic exams. We'll have a little bit of time then for question and answers for Kim, right? Between um, her section and then when we move on to a reframing section. So um, I'll kind of recap a lot of what Kim talks about from a slightly different angle. And then Eric will give us two case examples that will really reinforce um, all of the content that Kim and I both talk about and kind of put it in a way that's really approachable and really, um, really personal. And we'll end with some reminders and an additional time for questions. So I wanted to, to offer a couple of caveats around language. And um, we're going to be spending a substantial amount of time today discussing bodies, specifically parts of the body that are often um, gendered for most people. So all of us, uh, Kim and Eric and I, will likely use different language as we discuss some of the, the same parts of the body or some of the same concepts. So I've created this graphic just to kind of help remind us that we have medical language that's going to be really important to use and understand by other medical staff or by lawyers or other legal system people. And there's also cultural language terms that are more commonly used within trans communities to refer to specific body parts or identities. And although there's no universal consensus on language, um, you know, we need to keep in mind that it's extremely diverse and very plentiful. The third gear of this uh, 
graphic is what I've labeled trans-reflective. And in an ideal world, providers can reflect the language of their clients without inserting language that is um, from a transcultural lexicon or from medical terminology. The reality is that um, we, we probably need to have kind of a hybrid of both um, you know, more than one of these types of language in our verbal and written language use when we're working with trans or gender nonconforming clients. So please know today that you will likely hear more medical language than the other forms of language. And if we have time, we can talk about some of those other language uses at the end. The other caveat that I wanted to offer today is that um, normally on webinars and in trainings when we talk about trans issues, we're not talking about bodies. We're not talking about genitals. We're not talking about some of those very um, specific bodily realities. But today, because of the nature of what we're talking about, we are going to be talking about um, bodies in, in specific uh, ways and specific language. So um, I've kind of given it the R rating, but it's, it's definitely not not really R rating, but we, it's just different than what we would normally be doing. So before I hand things over to Kim, I wanted to just give us a brief review of who we're including when we're talking about trans people. So many times people have very specific ideas of who's included when they hear the word transgender. When we're using the word transgender, um, when we're talking about who's included under this very broad spectrum of people, um, we're including a lot of people. So we're including folks who are gender nonconforming, or people who may intentionally or not blur stereotypical cultural lines of binary gender. We're including people who transition from one gender to another. We're including people who are questioning their gender or who may not feel like the gender that they were assigned at birth fits um, who they are right now. We're including people who don't fit the binary, people who may identify with a gender other than male and female. We're also including people who are multiply gendered or who may live parts of their life in one gender and another part of their life in another gender um, or people who may identify as more than one gender. Um, and we're also including SAFAs, or significant others, friends, family, and allies. So we're including this really wide range of people when we're talking about um, transgender people or communities today. I wanted to remind folks, too, that when we're talking about trans folks, we're talking about people who might be on a, a masculine spectrum, who might have been assigned female at birth and are moving in a more masculine direction. We're including people who are assigned male at birth and who are moving in a more feminine direction. And there's this large um, kind of group in the middle that um, may not identify with masculine or feminine, may not be moving in any direction, um, and, and may have a really fluid identity um, or expression of their gender outwardly. So um, I just like us to keep in mind that we may see clients that are, you know, very clearly male or very clearly female um, who have transitioned, um, and we also have a lot of clients that are going to be in that non-binary or that gender fluid or the gender non-conforming area. So a couple of reminders around trans bodies and trans people's journeys. Not everybody wants to use hormones. There's a large number of trans people who can't afford hormones or they may not want to use hormones for a variety of reasons, many, many reasons. Similarly, uh, not everybody has had or would like to have surgery of any kind. So similar to hormones, um, you know, not everybody wants to, not everybody can afford to, um, and, and those are very complicated and, and difficult discussions to have. And you know, some of our other trainings have, have definitely looked at those two areas of what people want and, and how they have access or don't have access. Not everybody is uncomfortable with their body. So sometimes we think that trans people must automatically be uncomfortable with their body. Um, contrary to some popular myths, um, you know, some trans people are very comfortable in their bodies. Um, we also have to remember that, of course, some people are not comfortable in their bodies as well. Some trans bodies are very different from non-trans bodies, and some are not. And another reminder is that um, there might be service implications around trans bodies. You're going to hear a lot more today about um, this specific point about how we may need to use different strategies or there might be different risks, both medical risks and emotional risks. And there might be different tools that might be used in working with trans survivors of sexual assault. So those are a couple of reminders around trans bodies and trans journeys. 
And at the end of this section, I just wanted to show this, this image that will soon be up on your screen, which is from the Trans 100 from the year 2013. And it's just a, a sampling of the diversity of, of what trans people look like and who trans people are, and just um, this wonderful mosaic of, of trans people. So again, I'd like to just cover a couple of data points, a um, couple of statistics before Kim really starts talking about um, the details around forensic exams. So one of the questions that we're asked a lot is about the, the prevalence of sexual violence within trans communities. And we don't have really firm answers, but there's been a lot of research that's been done. And there's an estimate that it's between 50 and 66% of trans people have experienced sexual violence at some point in their life. A lot of times trans people experience sexual violence more than once in their life. Um, sometimes when they're children, sometimes when they're adults, sometimes both. Um, we don't really know the exact numbers, but we're pretty certain that it's 50% or higher um, for trans people. This, this number is pretty easily compared to some common rates that we normally hear about, where it's one in three girls or one in six boys um, or women or men. So it's definitely higher, and there's some, some implications around that, and we will talk a little bit about that today. The other piece I did uh, that I wanted to share with you is, is something that we found in a survey that we did in 2004-2005, and we asked people if gender was a contributing factor to their sexual violence. And of course, when we asked that question, it's a, uh, from their perspective. What, what was their perception of what happened and what caused it? Um, and as you can see on the screen, 43% of respondents said that gender was a contributing factor in their sexual assault. So a lot of trans people really have this linkage between who the core part of who they are is as a gendered person relates to this violence that's happened against them. So I think that's important to keep in mind when we look at how are people healing from sexual violence, how are they conceptualizing what happened to them, how safe do they feel walking around in the world. A couple other points on, on that interaction between um, who trans people are and sexual violence is that a lot of times we see things like uh, cutting or disfigurement happen in conjunction with sexual violence. So we're seeing sexual violence plus other forms of violence happening as well. If we look at it from a slightly different way, when we're looking at um, what has happened to trans people who have been murdered, a lot of times we see that there was sexual violence that happened prior to their murder. So there's definitely a linkage between um, excessive force and different types of violence and sexual assault within trans communities and trans people. So that's all the data that we're going to cover um, for this time, because we have a lot of other things that we'd like to, to spend our time talking about. I did want to just kind of point you in the direction of some of the other webinars that we've hosted in the past that would give you a lot more data if you're interested in the data and interested in, in more of the practical how-to things um, in general. One is uh, one that we did quite a while ago called Transsexual Violence. Um, you'll find it, you can see the screen. It'll show you how to find those recorded webinars. Another webinar that might be of particular interest is creating a trans welcoming environment. And the third one that you might be interested in is anti-trans violence in prison. So all of those, and there's, there's many other ones that are on the website too. So there are some places that you can start if you'd like some additional information on research and data. So now is the more exciting piece, which is um, our first guest speaker, Kim Day. So I'm really excited that we have her with us today. And I'm just going to turn it over to you, Kim, and you can share a little bit about um, IAFN and your role there and um, take us to the next section. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'll be happy to do that. Um, many of you who know me um, know that this picture is pretty old, and I am totally gray now and have a few more wrinkles. I am a nurse and work as the project director of the Safe Technical Assistance Project, um, which is an OVW funded project that provides technical assistance around the national protocol for sexual assault um, forensic exams, medical forensic exams of adults and adolescents. I'm also a forensic nurse examiner and um, was seeing patients in a local SANE program that I helped develop here in um, Maryland 
and I've been a nurse for over 35 years, which um, that means I started when I was five. Um, but I'm bringing my experience with patients who have been sexually assaulted in the national protocol to you today. And again, as Michael mentioned with language, the language I will use is healthcare oriented. For instance, I say patient-centered versus victim-centered. Um, I'll try to remember to clarify if I come upon any terms that I'm using that you may not understand or that you might not be familiar with. But if you're wondering what a particular term means that I don't clarify, please chat in and ask me to um, explain that. And on the next slide, um, I also need to go to a thank you to OVW because I also am an OVW TA provider. And the disclaimer is that what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, my own thoughts and recommendations and not necessarily those of OVW. So when I'm talking to you about the um, second edition of the National Protocol, which there's a picture up here, you also have a link on the FORGE website with um, a direct link to download the protocol. And um, there were many um, revisions and changes in this year's update or last year's update, some of which were directly related to the care of transgender patients who've been victims of sexual assault. Caring for transgender patients in any capacity is something that we actually rarely discuss in healthcare and as a whole, which causes huge disparities in access to care, and the medical forensic exam access is certainly no different than that. Um, when the revisions to the protocol were made, this issue was acknowledged, and it was also noted that the unique issues of transgender patients are neglected in sexual assault response protocols as a whole. As I said, if the issue to trans issue of transgender access to health care resources who are knowledgeable about their physical issues alone is something that is rarely discussed in healthcare as a whole. Is it any wonder that we've neglected it in the wider sexual assault responder community? And as you heard Michael talking about, the incidence is really high in this group. So um, as you can imagine, it contributes and compounds um, the victimization that's happened in their past. And I would um, also go for, so far as to even draw that they don't get access to um, criminal justice outcomes because of that. So this inclusion was really important to all the patients and the wider communities that we serve as we try to broaden our scope and our net um, to um, be able to serve people who have long-term health consequences from the sexual violence as um, SANE's and as forensic nurses in general. When we come to the next issue, I have a clip of um, someone with a maze, in a maze, because as I um, think about what um, victims in general and what patients have to go through um, when they come to us is just through so many barriers. Because I think that a maze kind of pictures well the issue of navigating medical services and advocacy and criminal justice for anyone. And it's difficult and troubling. And in the aftermath of a traumatic event like sexual assault, it can just be um, just absolutely um, overwhelming. The myriad of people that the patient has to interact with and all the issues going on around them and in them coupled with the fact that when we're working with transgender survivors, we as providers may be unfamiliar. And as nurses and advocates, well, you can understand that all of these combined together can contribute to further trauma for the transgender patient, which is really what we want to avoid. So you, so you may ask, well, what um, difference is there from any other victim? They all have multiple people to interact with, and isn't it confusing for anyone who's been a victim? Well, I just want to point out there's some very unique needs that transgender victims have when you're um, considering how to provide care. And so just a few of those needs are differences in body configurations. And as Michael said, there's already 
high degrees of, of not just one victimization, but sometimes poly victimization. Also, many have experienced discrimination and denial of services, including basic health care services. For those of you who are ER based, think of how many they have been, how, of how they have been treated in the past by the systems that are supposed to be helping them. And even possible abuse from other providers, including health care providers. Um, for this reason and more, it, these reasons, it's critical for the medical forensic exam settings and the clinicians providing care that we be culturally aware of trans-specific differences in order to provide sensitive and effective services, which we'll be talking about in the next slide. This is a um, kind of a real picture, and I guess Michael and I both are on this kind of same page with being real visual oriented um, of victim-centered care. And um, in, the, in the protocol, and actually on pages 32 to 42 of the protocol, 10 pages are devoted to this. And we have a handout on this. But um, it was with these things in mind that the second edition of the protocol incorporated the special population of transgender patients. On this slide, you see the caveats or principles of victim-centered care, or as we in the healthcare profession say, patient-centered care, that are emphasized in the protocol. Um, you can download the, the handout from the web as well as the protocol. But I think it's really important that we begin here, because it is this focus, being victim-centered or being patient-centered, that is central to the heart of the protocol. And it's really, um, this section is a real wealth of information. Specifically is mentioned um, is priority of care, um, privacy issues, adapting the exam, um, providing culturally responsive care, um, offering victim services, accommodation for support and responders, using language that the patient understands, and respecting the patient's priorities, realizing they may not be our own priorities, integration of procedures, safety for the patient, and physical comfort and patient needs. In other words, it's important to address the patient's fears and concerns that can affect their initial reaction to the assault, their post-assault needs, their decisions that they make before, during, and after the exam process. It's, a poor, it's really important to make, stop, don't make assumptions about the patient, even the offenders that have offended against them and the assault itself. Also forms, forms using, used, that we use during the exam process and discussion with the patient throughout the process should be framed in a way that doesn't assume that they are of a specific background or gender identity and gender expression. What we see on the outside is not always what's on the inside. And we always need to ask questions and actively listen to the patient's concerns and their circumstances and tailor the exam process to address their specific needs and concerns. So, <laughs> You may be saying, now what? What do I do? So this might be you right now, as, as some of us feel. For those of you who are the healthcare folks, you may be spinning or scratching your head. But I want to assure you that first and foremost, the first and foremost thing is something that you should be totally familiar with. And that's treating people with respect, dignity, and professionalism. Let them know that they are believed and that you're there to support them and provide them with all the alternatives necessary if they choose to proceed with the exam. Some other suggestions if you're still struggling. It's critical not to show surprise, shock, dismay, or concern when you are either told or in inadvertently discover that the person is transgender. So keep the shock down. Be especially careful about body language. I think as forensic nurses, we're often told things that are kind of difficult to even wrap your brain around. Um, and this is no different than those other times. You need to control expressions of discomfort, surprise, shock, or even embarrassment on your part. 
um, because it may be very upsetting to someone. And they may worry that you're making a judgment or assessment of themselves or their bodies. And you'll lose, absolutely lose opportunity to establish rapport. We also need to understand that um, transgender people have typically been subjected to other people's curiosity, prejudice, and, as Michael said, violence. So keep in mind that the victims may be reluctant to report the crime or consent to the exam for many reasons, but for fear of being exposed or inappropriate questions or even abusive treatment. If the victim does consent to an exam, be especially careful to explain what you want to do and why before each step. And, I, and I'm surely hoping that we do this anyways with all of our patients, but specifically respect their right to decline any portion of the exam. Always refer to victims by their preferred name and pronoun, even when speaking to others. And remember, on rare occasions, a trans patient may be accompanied by someone who does not know their identity or history. In these cases, you should ask the patient privately how they would like you to refer to them in that, patient, in that person's presence. And this brings up an important place to recall that patients should have the history taking done in private so that they'll be free to talk about what's happened to them. And I think that we all need to consider that when we're um, in some places where um, there are no private areas that you need to find one to be able to do your medical forensic history taking. So an important reminder, um, in any patient who reports a sexual assault, Remember, they should be referred to healthcare, and this is for advocacy, law enforcement, whoever is listening. There are long-term health consequences that a transgender person can have related to sexual assault and anyone, and they always should be referred to medical to prevent those long-term health consequences that can be with them for the rest of their lives. Um, and another point here is the exam that we do, the medical forensic exam, is relative to the anatomy that is present rather than the perceived gender of the patient or affirmed gender of the patient. Gender identity may include an internal sense of being male, female, bi, bi gender, multi gender, pan gender, two spirit, or any one of the more of hundreds of gender, gender identities. And I know that Forge website um, has a research link, has a resource sheet with um, a few of them, a few of the identity terms that people may use. Always refer to and treat the patient socially as their preferred gender. Be aware that transgender individuals may, ha may have increased shame or even dissociation from their body. And Michael brought this up a little bit ago. Um, and some are not. So it's, it's individualized. But some do use non-standard labels for body parts, and others are unable to discuss sex-related body parts. Reflect the patient's language when possible, and use alternative means of communication, such as you might be able to have the person draw or um, write down if, they're, if they can't verbalize what they, um, what's happened to them. Some patients um, transgender patients may have extreme discomfort with their bodies and may find elements of the physical exam traumatic. So the exam we are doing after a, an assault can cause further trauma. And to avoid this type of trauma, it's important to take your time with the patient. Remember that establishing good rapport with any patient, especially a sexual assault patient, is an essential component of the exam. It's actually critical. Allow the patient to establish the, state, the pace of the exam also, including frequent check-ins with them throughout the exam process. And here is where it's critical to have really strong advocacy with you during the exam, because they, they often can be a gauge um, when we're focused on um, collecting samples and swabs and setting up the room. The advocate can be critical to letting you know that the patient needs some adjustments in the process. 
So specifically, we're going to talk about um, some considerations in um, transmasculine patients. Um, remember, the exam should always be done with sensitivity to the patient's affirmed gender. Always address a male-identified patient with masculine pronouns and his preferred name, even when undergoing a vaginal exam. So right here, I've listed just, um, just basically four small considerations that can be really large and very concerning for us as a forensic examiner. One of those, the first one is hormone changes. And you're going to see this in both the transmasculine and trans, um, trans feminine patients. But you can see a range of development in patients that may be undergoing hormone therapy. And I think we will point out that some people choose to do this and some people do not. So it's important to note that all not, not all trans men will have chosen to undergo hormone therapy. However, if they do, they may have had, uh, they may have beard growth, clitoral megaly, which is an enlarged clitoris, acne, and androgenic alopecia or hair loss. Those who have bound their breasts for numerous years may have a rash or yeast infection of the skin under the breast. For those um, individuals um, that are taking testosterone, they can have vaginal atrophy or shrinking of the vaginal tissues, and the tissues become um, very um, unelastic and fragile. Transgender men who still have ovaries and a uterus can become pregnant, and this is a really important um, thing for us to remember as examiners. Um, if there's a uterus and ovaries pre present, they can become pregnant even when they're using testosterone, and many of them don't realize that and or have not been menstruating. They think if they're not menstruating, they can't become pregnant, and they still could be menstruating also. So, so recognizing that, um, that um, pregnancy is a possibility and offering and discussing in a really sensitive manner um, emergency contraception is important in this patient population. Um, if the transgender male individual has not had a hysterectomy, is still within childbearing years, and the nature of the assault suggests that, suggests that the possibility of pregnancy should be discussed, even if he has not had a period. So emergency contraception, again, should be offered, and that is a really important concept. Um, Trans men also may also have concerns about using emergency contraception because they may believe that any estrogen or progesterone-based medication may under, undermine their masculinity. In this same case, um, if, the, if the uterus and cervix are present, and this is the area of assault, a pelvic exam should be part of the clinical assessment. I will, need, I will say it needs to be, but remember, as with any patient population, we always seek consent before we do any part of the exam as we're proceeding. Another point to make here is that um, the vagina, when it's exposed to testosterone, especially in doses and over time, becomes more fragile, and it may sustain injury more readily than a vagina that's not been exposed to this hormone. And this also needs to be taken into consideration when preparing for the exam. For example, you may need to use a smaller size speculum. And that may be necessary if the tissues are atrophied and very fragile, which can often happen. Some of the surgical changes, if the patient has had surgical intervention, you may see um, post-chest surgery or mastectomy scar. The patient may have scar tissue consistent with the particular type of procedure that was done, including large nipples that may be present, or there may be small grafted nipples, depending upon the surgical techniques used. As there are several different options that may have been utilized for surgery on trans men, you may also find that they have had um, a neophallus which is created from the, small, the release of an augmented clitoris and looks much like a small penis, or a grafted penis constructed by a phalloplasty that will be larger, comparable to the adult-sized um, 
penis, but more flaccid than the natal male, unless, of course, there's a prosthetic implanted in the penis. Anticipate the need for specialty consultation. As you can see, the, many, of, many patients may have had surgical procedures done, and they may need a specialty surgeon to come in to see them. If there's damage or um, damage to the structures, um, individuals with the masculine identity may also sustain um, additional physical and emotional damage when vaginally assaulted. And if they're undergoing surgical procedures, like in the process of having surgery done, there may be a, bit, a special need to have consultation with specialty surgeons. You should, you should definitely be prepared for that as an examiner program by knowing which surgical staff is prepared to care for these injuries by um, gynecological staff or by, um, by uh, plastic surgery and have them as on call. Um, it's probably good to meet with them ahead of time and discuss, discuss the possibilities because you probably will find some in your area that are willing to come in and um, have, um, have experience of this nature. Be sensitive to the um, evidentiary, evidentiary value of prosthetics and patient choices. Now, now this is really um, an important point. Because you may get the patient um, coming in who uses prosthetic devices, and they can be very costly and difficult to replace. And they probably don't have more than one. And they also can be more vulnerable about their prosthetics. They may not want to part with them, such as penile prosthetics and breast binders. For, this, um, for reasons of safety and or cost, in cases where the prosthetic may be of evidentiary value, we need to consider alternative ways to collect forensic samples, such as swabbing the prosthetic and collecting samples from the surface of it, rather than actually bagging it up and sending it with a kit. Um, make sure if the patient declines to have it sent that we do think of alternative methods for um, collection of forensic samples. Also remember that victims' compensation funds may be available for purchasing new items, and this may help with concerns that the patient may have about the, um, about the cost, the replacement cost for these, device, these, these items. So as we move on to the um, trans woman patient, similarly, we should also address them with female, the female identified patient with female pronouns and her preferred name. Some of the hormone changes that we also may see, again, this is um, patient dependent, whether or not they're using hormones. Um, they may have feminine breast shape and size, often with relatively underdeveloped nipples. The breasts may appear fibrocystic in nature if there have been silicone injections. And galactorrhea, or leaking from the breast, is sometimes seen in trans women with high prolactin hormone levels and that's another hormone, especially those who are using breast pumps to stimulate development. Injective silicone may be common, and physical assaults or as, as, that may be involved in assault can dislodge that silicone, resulting in disfigurement, serious illness, or death. So we need to be aware of that and be observing um, those areas and documenting any, any injury. There may be minimal body hair present with variable facial hair, depending on the length of time they're on hormones, and they may have had manual hair removal, such as electrolysis. If testicles are, are present, they may be small and soft, um, with defects or hernias at the external inguinal ring area that may be present due to the practice of um, tucking the testicles up near or into the inguinal canal. So that would be another part of your evaluation, and also a part where they could be injured. Some of the surgical changes that um, you may see in the trans woman is um, a surgically constructed vagina, which is generally created from the skin of the inverted penis. And it will be less resilient than the typical vagina, which stretches, and as we all know, that usually it, it can stretch to um, have a child come out, so 
very stretchy, and, and the surgically constructed one um, may not be, will not be, as well as it's not as deep. Using a shorter build or smaller speculum is probably going to be necessary and should be considered before you set up for your exam. You need to have, um, you need to have your um, supplies ready. Also, because of those factors, there's also an increased likelihood of tearing and other physical damage during an assault, which again should raise our suspicion because it raises the risk of HIV and STIs. And trans women may place substantial emotional and financial value in their vaginas and therefore be especially distraught if it is assaulted and or damaged. So again, this may anticipate a need for specialty consultation. The surgical, you may have to call a surgeon in. The surgical construction may also require specialty um, consult if the surface of the vagina is damaged. The, um, the wall may be thinner and may be perforated more easily. Be prepared for that, knowing which surgical staff, again, is capable of caring for these injuries. Sometimes they may need to um, consult with their, um, their primary surgeon who's done the, um, the original procedure. Um, and again, here we come to the um, sensitive evidentiary value of prosthetics and patient choices. As with trans men, a trans woman patient may be more vulnerable to safety concerns if they leave things like breasts or, wig or breast form, wigs or breast forms as evidence. Since these items are often essential to publicly presenting as female. When possible, make sure that the trans woman has access to makeup and other items that will help them leave the facility presenting their gender in a way that will make them feel safe and create to the highest level of safety possible. As you all know, documentation is an essential component of the exam and includes both the written and photographic record of the patient encounter. Here are some specific recommendations. There are some specific recommendations for forms and body maps in the second edition of the protocol. And you have a picture of this one up here, and you have a download on the um, FORGE website and on the SAFETA website um, for you to download and use. In terms of written documentation, I love the additional information given on the handout from FORGE that includes informing the patient if you are using gender conforming body maps because your program uses them or your kit has that type of form, keep in mind the concept of know and tell why. To let your patient know that you're not disrespecting their gender by using a particular form. Let them know why you use the form that you did. Affirming it's because you want to best record their injuries and the assault. When using photography to document, be sure to be sensitive as you do for all patients person obtaining consent for each photograph that you need verbally and allowing the patient to decline. We need to recognize that many trans patients have had bad experiences in healthcare in general. And I know I've said that a couple times, but I can't emphasize it enough. We don't want to cause further trauma. Being sensitive to explain the necessity of all photographic documentation is important, keeping the know and tell why in mind in this portion of the documentation also. Another component when we are discussing documentation is to recognize that some transgender people, as well as other populations we see, may engage in self-harm or cutting as a coping mechanism. And I think we often see this in teen populations of, um, of any patient population. However, recognize that cutting and genital mutilation are also frequently a part of anti-transgender hate crimes. With this in mind, it is important to remain non-judgmental and careful not to make assumptions when documenting any scars or even new injuries. I always ask the patient if I see evidence of cutting if the scars are recent or older. Most times they share, they share with you if you're not making any judgments, if you're just asking about them. If they are a component of the crime, it should also be documented. So how can we make it better? 
what we want to know is how can we better serve the transgender patient? And I thought this little girl with the Band-Aid was really good. How can we fix this? Um, well, there's several things that we can work on process-wise that might help. And this is where um, this is where kind of the rubber meets the road. Being victim-centered, this is where we started and this is where we end up. This may be something you have never even looked at as a SANE program and as an individual. And I'm always, um, I'm always for seeking out new kind of information on how to do it better. One of the great things about webinars like this is um, they offer great resources for us to use in practice. In fact, Forge has created a, a fact sheet called Know and Tell Why, which you can find on the website um, for more information on how to be more culturally sensitive, including how to distinguish between appropriate and inappropriate questions. Because we've all done it. We've all asked the wrong thing. And as soon as it comes out of your mouth, you want to pull it back, but you can't. Ensure safety. Some victims, including transgender people, may also fear assault or belittlement by healthcare professionals and or law enforcement officials' responses to their gender identity or expression and or their body. And this may be different. This may be from treatment they have suffered in the past. And remember that. Treat the knowledge that the person is transgender as protected medical information, subject to all confidentiality and privacy rules, really important, especially remembering the companion of the patient may not even know their identity or orientation or sexual orientation. Safety planning also includes assuring the patient has a safe place to go. We know that as means, but we need to make sure there's a safety plan in place for all patients. And there also should be some sort of evaluation for suicidal ideation prior to discharge with every single patient. I hope that you all are doing that. Forms and body maps. Um, we already spoke about this some. But take an opportunity. This is a great opportunity to look at your intake forms and process, as well as your other documents that you use that ask about gender or sex. They should allow patients to write in a response or include transgender and intersex op options. Make sure the questions appropriately distinguish between sexual orientation, which is the gender someone is attracted to, gender identity, the internal sense of being a man, woman, or gender non-conforming, and their sex. And discharge planning. Some victims may um, want to talk about their perceptions of the, that the role of their gender identity may have played in making them vulnerable to an assault. Because of their um, value in uh, possible prosecutions under anti-hate crime laws, um, documenting what they say um, may be helpful for them. Otherwise, listen to their concerns as they're discharged. Um, assure them it was not their fault that they were sexually assaulted. If needed, encourage follow-up discussion with counseling and advocacy, and we do this with all of our patients. Encourage follow-up with counseling and advocacy on this issue. And another way to assure that you're meeting the needs of these patients is to include opportunities for trans patients to influence the development, include, include the patient to in, influence the development of sensitive responses for sexual assault. And referrals. Finally, we've been talking about referrals throughout this. Um, referrals to surgeons, referrals to advocates. Ensure that the referrals that you give the victim, that they've been trained or have experience with the special needs of transgender survivors of sexual assault. Recognize that you may have to connect with the patient's primary MD or primary physician for, the, for a consult with permission or with the surgeon who's working with the patient. If there are referrals that need to be made to caregivers that are not familiar with the patient, then remember that some transgender people may want your assistance in sharing their status with other providers, or some may not. It's just individual, according to the patient. Kim, this is Laurie Cook Daniels. I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, it, someone has asked about the interaction between testosterone and um, estrogen or progesterone hormones that are used for um, next day contraception. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm thinking we don't actually know how they work together because we don't have enough experience. But do you have a comment? Do you know more than I do? I'm going to, I'm going to say that it's, it's a one-time dose of emergency contraception. They're not going to be on it long-term like they may be on the testosterone. It should not, it should not affect um, a one-time dose. It's not like we're putting them on estrogen for 30 days or 60 days. It's the one-time dose of emergency contraceptives. Thank you. Michael? Yep. Well, Kim, thank you so much for sharing um, all of that just incredibly dense information. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff, which is really, really great. Um, and I know that you need to, to leave a little bit early. Do you have some time to answer any additional questions that may come up right now? or? Uh, I'm actually I'm I actually don't right now, but okay. I'm happy to take email um, email questions, and my email is right up on the slide, so um, I will be happy to answer any questions that I can that I can. That's perfect. And so the people that are listening, we can um, you can di directly write Kim. It sounds like, or you can sure. feed them through sure. us, and we can we can send them off and and you know, maybe share the answers with everybody, which would be probably more helpful um, to everybody that's attending. So Great. thank you very much for yep. being here. All right. Um, I really appreciate the information that you shared, and I know this was just really valuable to so many um, of us who, who are not as familiar with forensic exams and, and these, you know, very specific things that you talked about today. So thank you. Um, we're going to change pace a little bit, and um, I'm hoping that, that Eric is on the line with us, and we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, we had a little bit of content that we were going to share, and I think that Lori and I will record it separately later, and then um, add that to the recordings that are available online. So, um, Eric, are you on the on the line? Yes, I am. Excellent. Let me Can just forward. Me? Okay. Let me forward to your slide, and um, we're really thrilled that you're here with us, too. And um, I know you're calling in remotely, and I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about who you are and um, who you work for, and, um, and then lead us into the couple of case examples that you're going to share with us. Sure. Thank you, Michael. I'm, my name is Eric Stiles. I work for the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. I'm the Rural Project Specialist. And what that means is I go around do a lot of training in TA and technical assistance around um, issues in rural communities, but I also work a lot with the LGBTQ AH communities as well as men. Um, previously, though, prior to this work, I worked as an advocate in a rural community. And I just want to highlight that starting off working in a rural community, individuals think that you can't possibly have worked with trans community. Um, that's not the case. Trans folks are throughout all the communities. So the two case studies I have today, both are experiences I've had that I'm going to shield as much detail um, to keep everybody confidential. But I'd like to share them to give a little bit more of the, the story behind what happens um, maybe after the fact of having sexual assault examinations and some of the importance of how we interact with survivors uh, really plays a role in their well-being long term. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is, is a young male uh, who, after the sexual assault examination, um, contact, uh, was referred to our agency um, because they knew that there was somebody there who could work with him. And he was um, struggling with follow-up. So as um, Kim was talking about with having um, birth control, he had to go to an OBGYN for follow-up to take care of what had taken place with the assault, to make sure that rips and tears were taken care of. But a lot of our job as an advocate was working with the post-OBGYN visits and um, pre-OBGYN visits because there was a lot of shame and guilt and confusion over gender, meaning he felt that his gender had let him down. If he was more masculine, if he could pass better, he wouldn't have been assaulted. And that his own body parts betrayed him because now he's going to an OBGYN and it's just highlighting the body parts that he felt were not true to who his being was. So my job as an advocate really got pushed um, beyond that 
initial kind of let's go somebody to an OBGYN, but also having sessions to help wrap up before he could go back in the community and socialize and interact. He felt like <clears throat> the way he was being perceived in the community was too feminine. Um, so he was really concerned about his gender identity and sexual violence took that to the core of his being and going through sexual assault examination, as Kim mentioned, um, can be a very traumatizing experience in itself um, for highlighting those aspects of um, that he did not feel were appropriate and aligned with his gender. So that's the first one. And I know everybody's um, tight on time, so I'll go into the second one real quick, and then we'll have some time for questions. And the second one um, deals with, um, this is years down the road, um, a female was um, started coming in because they were assaulted previously, um, they were drinking, they believed that something maybe was put in their drink, uh, the assault took place, and when they came to, after being beat up, um, also in the assault, the sexual violence assault, um, they came to without a wig on, without any um, bra, and they felt completely naked, and they were just, um, she was just totally mortified that here she woke up not feeling like herself. And then she had to walk out, and she felt like she was this big choke, and that no one took her seriously. And this is years and years after this took place that I was meeting with her. So a lot of our time spent together was working on how would you um, work through a lot of trauma that took place in the actual examination after the assault, because everything was taken, and they kept referring to her, her as male. Um, she felt very stripped down, very alone in the world, and <laughs> it caused, consequently caused a lot of problems for her down the road because she felt she couldn't pass before, she felt like she can't pass now, and having all these things taken away from her um, that made it so that in her mind she felt like she would be expressed as herself as a woman really um, made her journey to healing a lot more um, traumatic for her. So I rush through both of those examples, but the key points to them for advocates on the phone right now on this webinar and anyone working with survivors is really slowing down and being present for everybody and being in the moment. So being with that individual survivor in the moment and hearing what their needs are and seeing them for their needs and not kind of conforming to some sort of form, conforming to the state protocol. And like Kim said, being very sensitive to the idea of how we dress ourselves and how we uh, make our appearance is extremely important in taking away those things that make us a whole person um, can really cause problems for how much trauma we've received from that examination. So really being present and listening and seeking their guidance um, with both survivors I ask them what's worked for them in the past, and I ask them how they've gone through it because they both had a lot of resiliency. But I also um, ask them what type of support they needed. And at times they didn't know, so I just stayed around. And hearing my language now is I just stayed around. But I listened. I made time to listen until they came up with what they did need. So they might need more time going to the visit for OBGYN and speaking with me afterwards or they might need longer sessions because it's an anniversary date of the hospital coming in. So <laughs> really taking into account every individual for where they're at. And Michael, I know you might have some questions, but I think I made it in time for us. Um, you made it in super time. You, you could have taken a little bit more time. And I'm wondering if okay. we, could have, <laughs> we could have a little bit of a dialogue about it because I think that, that these two yeah. cases are really, um, they're really great examples um, of, of what people might be experiencing and what providers may, you know, see in their everyday work when a trans client is coming in. And, you know, I know you spoke at the end about, you know, just that process of just, not just listening, but listening, just, you know, spending time listening to what's going on. And I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about that in reference to both of these cases or um, in other situations that you may want to share. 
Um, yeah, I will definitely can talk about in both these cases, but in general as well. The first thing um, I think it takes to listen is not to make assumptions, um, especially in the communities that I've worked in. Um, individuals had a variety experience of their gender expression, and also a lot of it came down to money. So if there's sexual violence that took place, um, so both individuals were not going through surgery, both individuals were, <laughs> were not transitioning, they were considering themselves, and they do consider themselves to be the gender they express. Um, so to listen to someone's story when they're, you have an outside culture that is surrounding them and telling them they're wrong, the hospital treats them like a different gender, really takes some balancing act because not only are you listening in one part, but you're also kind of advocating in the second part. So when they express to you, refer to me as male, you refer to them as male, of course, but when you go out in the community or you talk to an OBGYN and you're helping them and you're advocating, it's taking that with you. And that one step that seemed natural at the moment for me, for example, with the first individual, by telling the nurse at the OBGYN center that um, his name is X, um, really meant a lot because it meant I listened and I didn't even take into account how much that meant to the survivor. But the survivor appreciated that I listened enough to take into account the pronouns being used and referring to him as who he was. So we had to slow down, listen, and really take what they say to heart. And what that means is being attentive, uh, not looking for the right answer. There were lots of times I wanted to fix things meeting um, the second individual when she would talk about how she was treated in the community and ridiculed and treated as she wasn't a woman, I wanted to fix it. I wanted to go out and do all these things to change, but I couldn't. But what I could do was be there in the moment and hear what she was expressing and her feelings behind it. <coughs> Part of that active listening with um, individuals from any community is you have to take your time. Um, it it really is against my nature to rush through things like this, like this webinar. But in the moment working with survivors, you need to make that time. And working with trans survivors, sometimes that time takes longer. I did not hear the story from the second individual. I didn't hear from her the complete story of what happened to her in the hospital years before until maybe uh, three or four months, five months into working with her. And then she expressed it because she needed to have that time for herself to figure out how to communicate with me. And there were missteps in my part, too, as well that I did not necessarily think about. So it's a combination of offering time, but also just being very well, you make mistakes. And one of my mistakes with her in our communication, I should say, not with her, in our communication was when she expressed very early on that the sexual assault examination that she went through, um, the trip to ER, she put it, was very traumatic. I didn't pick up on how traumatic because I didn't ask. I just let it go. I was like, OK, I understand that. In my mind, I understood that. So. I thought I understood, so I didn't ask any more questions or be supportive of that. So it took months to come back around to that for her to find her space to bring that up. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, you you kind of brought up some points that that we continually kind of remind providers around about um, with being patient and persistent and compassionate. And sometimes I think trans survivors really need. I don't want to say more patients than other people do, but sometimes there's a history of mistrust and uh, an uncertainty of how people are going to respond. And so it takes a little while for those stories to come out. Um, and it sounds like that's what was happening with the second case for you. Yes, and it takes, I don't think the trans survivors need more patients from us. In my mind, I framed it over time as it takes a very lot of, uh, it takes a lot of patience for us to overcome the damage done by society. Yes. It's not them that need it. It's the damage that's done that needs it. So there's a lot more space that we need to create in our environments 
for them to have a safe space because so much space has been taken from them in the communities they live in. So it takes more time to build that space and it takes more time to build all of that. And it's not because of them individually, it's because of what society has done, not because of them. Exactly. Do you have some comments on, on how people can create that space? Um, one is very kind of fundamental space building, and that is in our offices, of course, having literature and information and being open and having trainings and uh, receiving things from, from like Forge and other trainings on these concerns starts creating that culture and change. You have to create that change in your agency, but it doesn't stop there. That has to be communicated to your hospital, to the law enforcement. So you now become the advocate in the community before you ever see someone come in. And then beyond that is when you start creating that space and giving that time, being aware. If we work with children, for example, and I'm not comparing trans people to children, but advocates kind of get in this niche where you're adult survivors or you work with children or you work with this community or that community. Um, and we kind of get pigeonholed in that. But working with trans survivors, they're all ages. So we have to look at it across the lifespan, and we have to look at how does that play out in each role, and how can we create more time. So if we go out to a school with a trans individual who's being sexually harassed and bullied and has been sexually assaulted, what do we need to do to create that space in that school versus what do we need to do to create that space in the hospital setting? And then in ourselves, we need to have somebody to go to to debrief, somebody to go to to talk to, somebody to go to to bounce ideas off from, and we need to build a sense of real investment in the community. It can't be just lift service, like here's a specialized population to work with. We need to make real allies within the community and have real conversations, and at times those conversations can be very uncomfortable because if you're not from the community, you're going to hear really um, solid and concrete truth. So you make partnerships, you find local agencies, whether that local agency is within a state or a national agency, to start building some focus groups and some conversations. But we don't just take from the community, we give back. And then individually as an advocate, we prepare ourselves to have the ability to be more trauma-focused in all of our work, not just with trans, but to give ourselves time for each individual to have the time it needs. So if they need two hours, we give two hours. If they need an hour, we give an hour. Does that answer some of the questions for you, Michael? That's perfect. That's really, really perfect. Um, I'm wondering if we should shift a little bit next to um, some take-home reminders and um, just reminders for folks about what um, other things Forge can offer people, and then we'll have some time for some questions. So as people are thinking about questions, feel free to type that in the question area, and Lori will sort through them, and, and I think Eric, you and I are the only two left, and we'll sort the other questions for Kim and get those to her for her responses later on. So let me just uh, bring us through a couple of very, very brief take-home reminders. Um, one of the just, I want to make sure that folks know what um, we, uh, Forge, can offer you. And uh, a lot of you have seen this slide before if you've been on our webinars. Um, but we offer training and technical assistance for providers, victim service providers. And you know, some of what that involves is doing one-on-one -on -one support. We do an incredibly high volume of one-on-one -on -one support. So you email us or call us with a question about a trans client or a trans survivor or a situation that you're thinking about, and we will work through it with you the best that we can to get to a solution that feels comfortable and right for you and or for your clients. Uh, we obviously offer webinars just like this one every month, and um, we're really pleased that we have really a wide variety of topics that we've covered and that we will be covering. So please join us in the future on um, additional webinars. May is going to be another guest speaker, um, Rebecca Drake from the Stalking Resource Center. So uh, we'll talk about stalking in May. We also provide trainings across the country. Um, I know Eric is training across the country too right now. And um, I, yeah, I really enjoy traveling and Lori enjoys traveling. And so, um, we're at many of the conferences across the country, and, and we're pleased to do that. We also do some individualized trainings uh, when we're asked to, to come places. So we can we do that when we can and when we're able to. And the other thing that we offer for providers is uh, a 
variety of different publications. Kim referenced a couple of them when she was speaking, and, and you can easily see them. When I send out the follow-up, I'll link to a couple specific ones that you may be particularly interested in. And then we all also offer support uh, directly to trans survivors uh, because a lot of times trans survivors don't get access to the healing services that they need um, because they're in places that don't have a lot of trans support or don't have a lot of providers with trans knowledge. So we have uh, you know listservs that are 24-7 where people can connect to other survivors and other loved ones. We do a lot of referrals so people um, don't know where to go or who to go to and we can try to help them get connected in a place that's closer to them um, geographically to get the support that they need. We offer an online Writing to Heal group because a lot of times we're finding that trans survivors are not able to access in-person support groups. So we've we've chosen to do Writing to Heal as, as our type of support group for folks, and it's a trauma-informed, writing-based group. But it's all online, so anybody can access it from anywhere in the country if they have access to a library or, or public uh, computer or private computer. And the fourth thing that we offer for survivors is a relatively new project called the Espavo Project. And the two photos that you saw in the, the slides when Eric was talking are from the Espavo Project. So they're professionally taken photographs of people who want to be involved in this project. And the people are crafting statements of resilience. So it's a really healing process to have an image that they feel really proud of and really good about, and then craft a statement that shows um, how they've survived and, and and who they are as, as this current thriving person. So that's a little bit about what we can offer you. So a couple of, of take-home reminders um, about assumptions. And, and Kim and, and Eric both talked about a lot of these things. So these, I'm just going to very quickly go through them, and we can do some questions. So if you have assumptions, um, you know, check in with yourself about what gender-based assumptions that you're making. And try to leave them at home or before you enter that, that exam room or that office with somebody. Another reminder is, is something that I don't think we think about very often, but to celebrate the limitless ways that bodies can be configured. We all have different bodies, and um, trans bodies are no different in that you know, we all have different bodies. So let's figure out how we can be celebratory and appreciative of the differences in, in our bodies. Another reminder is to um, kind of keep calm and be prepared. So we, we all need to be prepared to hear anything. And I know Kim specifically talked about um, a lot of times we hear really difficult information when we're talking with survivors. And when we're talking with trans survivors, we may hear unexpected information. So we need to just be prepared and um, not show our surprise, even if we feel a little bit surprised. Another reminder is to um, know and tell why. And I know Kim talked in, in much more detail than I was expecting her to about know and tell why. So know why you need to ask a question and uh, let your client or patient or survivor know why you're asking so they don't feel objectified or that um, they're the object of your curiosity. Another reminder is to think creatively um, to find workable solutions. So. You know, sometimes people do not fit into the service systems that we have. And so if they don't fit into those, what can we figure out um, about how to help them get the service and the care and the healing that they um, deserve and, and, and need? So sometimes that's really tricky, and sometimes it takes time, and sometimes it takes a lot of time. But I think that if we are patient enough and persistent enough that we can end up getting to a place that will do something to help the survivors that are in front of us. And I think all of us really know this last slide very well, but we, you know, I think that it's really important to empower our clients with respect and compassion and information and choices. And I think that um, you know, all of us who work uh, with victims or survivors do this. And I think sometimes it's important just to have um, it be articulated and overtly stated that we you know, keep that empowerment as a primary focus when we work with clients. And I think it's especially true for, for trans people who oftentimes feel disempowered. And then when they're sexually assaulted, they feel disempowered around that as well. So those are the couple of, of take-home reminders. And I'd love to move on to questions. Um, if, Lurie, if you've collected some of them, let's yes, I, do some questions. Yes, I have some questions. Um, and one that I think both of you may want to address, we've had two people say, what else should be in our kits? At the, um, 
in our same kits to help things like with the wigs. Um, of things that people may want to add to their kits. Eric, would you like to start with these? I'd, I'd like to have you probably start with most of yeah. the questions. Okay, um, sure. Well, one thing you can do is I know there's some advocates in Vermont that have carrying carts uh, where they have um, different items that they can have at the hospital or have at their center ready for individuals to use. So um, makeup, wigs, bindings, items that they can um, put um, give to survivors so they can help address how they look before they leave the hospital. Um, I know it takes a lot of communication to get a hospital around to, I know often at times just to have rape kits and extra clothing there. Um, so having this come up seems like a burden, but it's really not. You can actually start pulling it in because some of these items don't always just go to transgender folk in your community because um, I've had makeup used at our hospital for individuals who aren't from the trans community. I've had wigs used from people who aren't. I had a cancer survivor use a wig. So there are, there are other purposes for most of these items that you can just put them with your stuff at the hospital if you store them there. Or you can have it at your agency that someone can stop by and take to the hospital with them before going to the hospital coming in. Um, the list, I would suggest, and Michael, maybe you would know the individual I'm thinking from Vermont, maybe she has a concise list. I think she actually does, if memory serves me right. That would be really great if she did. I don't know that she does, and I know, um, I know who you're talking about, and I will um, contact her directly to see if she has a list. Um, but like you were saying, Eric, I think that there's a lot of things that are used by non-trans people as well, like wigs for people who have cancer. Um, things like ace bandages can be used for binding, but they can also be used for lots of other things, or scarves to cover heads. I mean, there's lots of yeah. items that have dual purposes. Um, I think in particular are things like larger sized clothing. Um, a, lot to, a lot of trans yeah. women are larger sized, but there's a lot of larger sized people who are not trans as well. So you know, having some of those items um, available, whether they're on site or at somebody's um, agency, is, is very useful. We will try to Thank you. That. Thank you. How do you balance the importance of getting the patient alone for the medical history with their desire to be accompanied by their support person if they don't want that person to be sent out of the room? What are the patient's rights regarding having other people present with them during their medical visit? Well, I know that in, I'll speak to Pennsylvania, and Michael, I hope you can go to nationally, and I know some that, um, other states. Um, support people, I know that I sat um, behind curtains for survivors before. I had um, other individuals, like their family support that they had there. And I say family because they refer to them as family. Um, that's really important to take into account what they signify others to me, um, be there as well, um, to show support for them um, behind curtains and in the room. And we had some lovely noise in there. Sorry about that. Did you have more to say, Eric? I'm sorry. I was, it was hard to hear with the, the screeching. I think it's a fire alarm in the building. So, um, but it's, it went off. So, now that was it. And, and I just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, one of the things that we recommend, and, and I think others are starting to recommend as well, is it, it's fairly, uh, you can do a fairly quick assessment of if somebody is accompanied with somebody who might be uh, an abuser to just determine whether they are or not or, or what the level of comfort is with that person. Um, and so that alone time can happen prior to the medical history, which a trans person or anybody may want to have somebody present. So I, I heard what Kim said, and I, you know, I, I wish she was still on the call because I think there is some variation around when it's important for people to have uh, somebody in the room with them. And I think you know my primary concern tends to be around we want to make sure that that other person, um, the accompanying person, is is not the abuser or not the perpetrator. Larry, are there other questions? Yes. Thank you for the case scenarios. Really helpful advice. I am a rape crisis coordinator in an adolescent health center. 
I refer adolescents for the forensic exams and for follow-up care. Are there specific needs to trans youth versus trans adults? Eric, you're probably going to have a much better answer for that than I will. I wonder if we just lost Eric. We may have. Well, let me let me start with the question, and hopefully Eric will be able to get back on. Um, so the question was around, are there specific concerns or things to prepare for trans youth versus other youth? Is that the question? No, trans youth versus trans adults. Trans youth versus trans adults. Yeah, I think I think one of the, the primary concerns is going to be is, is that trans youth out to their family? Um, what are some of the legal um, challenges that they might be concerned about? Um, they may be worried about if their their parents find out certain things. Um, I, I think there's a lot of just privacy concerns that trans youth might be experiencing that trans adults could better take care of because they're not dependent. This is, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. I'm sorry. A um, couple things to think about is the age group of trans youth. So if the youth are very young, um, often the parents are very supportive and they have identified that and can be around that. I'm not saying often, but if they, um, parents often support and buy their children the, uh, the clothing for the children. So if they are below the age of 10 and there's something has taken place, the parents might be one of the strongest advocates. So taking into account what the parents are there and their strong advocates helping them um, with the process. You start getting to teens, like Michael said, there might be a disconnect between what parents know and what parents don't know about their youth. And that becomes the problem now of how they identify themselves, especially after the assault um, in the emergency room, especially if they are called in. Um, in our state, below a certain age, parents get called in, but they still might be judging differently than what their parents think they should be um, for the gender of the parents that are referring them. So taking all that into account, the difference between youth and the adults would be really um, trying as an advocate to establish where that relationship is from the survivor about the relationship to their parents and support, and then going from there and taking their lead. Thank you. I have another one. I have heard from our SANE nurses that when a trans individual does not reveal the bio parts, it is a waste of resources. For example, doing a pregnancy test on a trans woman. What are some responses I can have to their comment while advocating for the population in general? Oh, OK. Um, I've never been faced with that before, but off the top of my head, Something I would come up with is um, pregnancy test for a woman who might not be able to conceive a child. Would that be a waste of test? And if the person says no, um, because they, um, how would they know? That's the same difference. That, that's what response I'd give. How would we know? We treat an individual for who they are coming in, and if they identify as that. Um, my concern is. Uh, about where that's coming from, that question, if the nurses or the individuals, the doctors who are asking this question about wasting resources, if it's coming from a, like a bigoted place, um, and also what type of conversation are they having with the individuals that come in with that identify as trans, they don't feel comfortable enough to share information, if there's something that there's a breakdown between the way they provide services. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I have someone else here saying, I have advocated for trans men and women. Since LEA and SANE were both very insensitive, I asked to speak to my client first to ask their permission to speak directly to LEA and SANE about how they were treating my clients. One didn't want me to, so we discussed the treatment they received after. Eventually, they gave me a release of info to speak with LEA and SANE. The other client was okay with me advocating for them. After speaking, I just turned my um, thing off. <laughs> I am sorry. I have lost the um, the question. I um, okay. 
After speaking to LEA, I really dislike how this these come up. I'm sorry. I'm looking for the question too. So. Um. Laura, do you want to go to the next question while I look to see if I can find the original that you're you're reading? Okay. I um, learned from our pharmacy that some drugs are dosed based on parameters that take into account the patient's biologic sex. Thankfully, none for sexual assault patients directly, but maybe so if critical injury and admitted. How have hospitals handled that? The gender is a field that registration answers on arrival. I don't really have an answer for that. Do you, Michael? Um, I you don't. Know, I'm multitasking, so maybe Lurie has an answer to that yeah. one. Um, I think that when when we start dealing with um, the health care of transgender people and medical norms, there needs to be some creative thinking about what is it that the norms are set by. For instance, are they set by the average weight of men versus women? Are they set by um, the testosterone present or the estrogen present? We, need to, we may need to go back a little bit and think about why are there differences in order to figure out what would be appropriate ways to handle that difference with regard to a person who is uh, transgender? Thank you for that. So I did find the original question, which is talking about um, working with trans men and trans women um, and LEA and SANE. Um, and the last part of the, that question um, was after speaking with to LEA and SANE interview and exam um, was more respectful and went a lot better. Is there an, any other way that could, um, that this could have been handled, um, the problem being LEA and SANE's don't like being interrupted? Um, I think that goes to kind of, and this is my mindset, Michael, and I maybe have different points, is kind of getting ahead of the curve with this. I think the more we look at individuals as a whole being, and we know that there's no cookie cutter for any type of individuals, then that really pushes us as advocates to get out there and ahead of the curve and really start advocating before we see an individual from a certain community come in, and this includes those from trans. Now, I'm not saying we can do that um, like before any trans people have come in, but before we are faced with that in the ER. So we go out, we start talking about ways that we know of. We can use trainings, we can use resources, some from FORGE, definitely some from FORGE, on helping the law enforcement and nurses um, slow down their practice, um, make room for more questions, like Kim said, um, explain why they're asking questions more, and really put that into practice. And through doing that advocacy work prior to someone coming in, seeing them in that crisis moment, you have more ability and resources and bridge to go back to and say, well, this is a time for us to take a, a break or slow down, and that might be something you work in while you're talking to these other agencies. That's a really great example or a great answer to that question. Um, I'm really aware of our time, too, that we've got a couple minutes left, and I, I believe that there are more questions that we will um, feed out and um, send by email to people or post on the web and send you uh, the link to those questions and answers, because um, I'm hoping that Eric would be willing to participate in some more of those questions offline, and I know Kim is as well. Um, I want to just... Yeah, good. Thank you. I was hoping that would be the answer. Um, I, I really wanted to, to just remind folks of a couple of things that we mentioned in the beginning. One is that we'll be sending out the PowerPoints tomorrow. Um, you'll get an email tomorrow. They'll have a link to the PowerPoints and a link to the recording of today's session.
Um, when the window closes today at the end of the webinar, there will be a, a very short survey, and we really care about your feedback. It's also another place that you can ask questions, so feel free to ask more questions in that, that brief survey. Um, but we really value your input, and we try to adjust our webinars to, to meet your needs better. Um, next month's topic, as I think I mentioned before, is on stocking. So May 8th, the webinar is, is already open for registration, and I hope that you will consider joining us next month. Um, Rebecca Drake with Stocking Resource Center will be online with us. Um, and I really wanted to thank uh, Kim and Eric for, for being with us today and sharing their really amazing knowledge with us. Um, it's, it's really amazing to have guests and guests who are so um, smart and bright and caring. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you everybody for attending and, and caring about trans survivors and, and how to work better with uh, the trans community. So thank you everybody. Thank you Michael and thanks to Forge for all the work that you do and thanks to all the advocates and nurses out there right now for all the work that you're doing. And just take it easy, take time and be patient with yourself and do this work when it's all growing. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.